My name is Dot. I'm 22 years old. I'm from North Dakota, and I have a lot of tattoos. I got my first when I was 17. Shout out to the tattoo artist who knew the ID wasn't mine, but inked me up anyway. And after that, I was hooked. I got a sleeve over the course of about nine months during my late teens. I got my neck covered with a skull and flower motif. I got a wolf covering pretty much my entire right thigh. I even got a small face tattoo. Provocative, I know, but in for a penny and in for a pound of flesh, as they say. I know some people look at me and think that I'm some kind of trashy method loser or something, but once you get to know me, people realize I'm smart, loving, a thoughtful person whose ink has no bearing on their actual personality. I make a great babysitter. I know I'm great with kids, and all of the families whose kids I took care of learned that for themselves after taking a chance with me. Maybe that makes me sound kind of full of myself, and I hope it doesn't, and I'd like to think it's fully justified, given some of the cruel things that have been said to me over the years. And this brings me to my next point. I don't think I'm the prettiest girl in the world, but the extent of my tattoos sometimes has a certain effect on men. I don't want to go into too much about what those entail. I'm sure you can all guess if you apply a little imagination, but... I really, really hate some of the lewd and inappropriate comments I get when someone with no mouth filter sees my ink. At best, it's just annoying, and a guy quickly gets the message when I tell him to stick his non-compliments where the sun doesn't shine. But then at worst, men can get very, very frightening when they're not used to being told no. This story involves one of those. In May of 2019, I was on my way to one of my regular babysitting jobs on a humid Friday night and I needed to stop at a gas station to top up my tank. I live in quite a rural area and despite this gas station being a pretty regular stop for me, it's the only one for miles and miles around. So while it gets its fair share of regulars, it gets plenty of visitors who aren't from the area and sometimes they're not even from the Rough Rider country at all, they're just passing through. I'm guessing this guy was just passing through because I'd never seen him before and he was wearing a black Minnesota Vikings cap and I don't know if it was because I was hungry or just generally in a grouchy mood, but when he started slurring lewd comments my way, I gave him the business, particularly harshly. I told him I was probably his daughter's age, assuming he had one, and asked how he'd like it if a guy started talking to his little girl the way he was talking to me. He then made some comments about how he'd never let his daughter, guessing he did have one, quote-unquote ruin her body in the way that I had. And comments like that used to hurt me, but not anymore. They're like water off a duck's back these days, so I told him to go jump in a lake. A nicer version of what I actually said. I don't want to get your video taken down, so I won't say it. And then just paid for my gas and drove off. I didn't think I was being followed, but then again... I don't think I looked at my rear view the whole freaking drive home. Like I said, I live in a pretty rural area and unless you pass through a small town or whatever, there's not much need to actually check your rear view while you're out on the main highways. So when I got to the place I was babysitting, I had absolutely no idea of what was to befall me that night, not a single clue. So it was with blissful ignorance that I parked my car knocked on the door, then went inside to chat with the mom and say hi to the little man. A few hours go by and I mostly occupy myself by playing Nintendo Switch games with the little guy and deliberately losing to make him feel good about himself. You know how it goes. Not that I'm any good at Mario Kart or whatever, and sometimes I didn't even have to pretend to be slipping off the track to let him pass me, but it brings me a lot of joy to see him happy. Anyway, at about 9pm, which is way later than his regular bedtime, partly the reason he loves me and says nice things to his mom about me, I take the little guy to bed and read him a story until he's snoozing soundly. After that, I help myself to some of the leftovers that the mom had left for me. She's a great cook, so I take no offense at her leftovers. Then I settle into the couch to watch TV and text my friends. And right about then is when I hear a knock at the door. I get up to answer it, kind of nervous about who it might be, but still not wanting to refuse just in case it's important or something. But then when I open the door, there's no one there. Kids play pranks, right? 
and even though it's a rural area where the houses are sometimes like a half a mile apart, it could have just as easily been a bunch of kids who cycled over just to get up to no good, right? That's what I told myself anyway. I'm not the type to just freak out over a game of ding-dong ditch, so I just closed the door, muttered something about dumb kids under my breath, and went back to watching TV. Not long after that, it happens again. Only the knocking on the front door is even louder this time, and kind of interspersed too, almost like some kid was kicking the door or something. I got really mad thinking it might actually wake the little guy upstairs, in which case it would be super difficult to get him back to sleep. So that time, I opened the door, took a few steps outside, and looked around to see if anyone was watching the door or hiding in the darkness. There was no one in sight, but I definitely wanted to warn the kids off from doing it, so in a voice that I tried to keep low enough not to wake the kid up upstairs, but loud enough for anyone close to hear, I told whoever it was that if they bashed on the door like that again, I'd be calling the cops. In the moments after I spoke, nothing moved, and nothing stirred. There was just this dead silence hanging in the air, which actually started to give me the creeps after a while. It was obvious that whoever had done the banging was still close. I didn't hear any bikes pedaling or voices or anything like that. I knew someone was there, maybe even watching me too, so... Feeling pretty exposed, I turned around to walk back inside the house. I can't even really describe the kind of terror I felt when I turned and saw that black Viking's cap staring me in the face. Even with the lessons in writing I got, I'm still struggling to find the words to describe that sensation. All that cliched stuff like my blood ran cold or a shiver went up my spine, they sound like they sound like stuff out of a campfire story compared to what actual heart-pounding terror felt like. I think that was the first thing I felt, my heart just thumping at a mile a minute as I got this oh-no alarm bell feeling in my head. I was outside, alone, with this guy who had been making lewd comments to me at the gas station and who'd obviously followed me to the family's house, maybe even thinking that it's where I lived. The next thing I know, his big, calloused hand just flies up towards my throat, and I feel almost all my air cut off. I have to make these scary-sounding wheezing noises just to get the air into my lungs. I remember how my hand shot up to his wrist, trying to pull his hand away from my throat, but he was just way too strong for me to even budge it. I kicked out at him, tried to land it where it would hurt him the most, but my first and only effort landed on his thigh. After that, he held me out at arm's length so I couldn't reach him, and every time I tried to kick him again, I not only missed completely, but he squeezed just a little harder for a second so I couldn't breathe at all. In the end, I was basically just hanging there, feet only touching the ground because I was on my tiptoes as he started smiling at me. I don't want to repeat exactly what he said. Like I mentioned earlier, I don't want to get your channel in any trouble with YouTube for obscenity or anything, but... I remember every freaking word. To paraphrase, he basically said that a girl like me should know better than to talk to a man like I had, and that he'd take a great deal of pleasure in teaching me a lesson that I should have learned years ago. He made some comment about how he'd had to wait quite a while to make sure I was home alone, but he was glad that he did, because now no one would be able to stop him from doing what he said that he was going to do. Like I said, I don't want to quote the guy, mainly for the sake of my own mental health at this point, but trust me when I say that his description of the act he wanted to perform on me was graphic to the point of nauseating. Again, I can barely describe the feelings that boiled up inside me, knowing that he was about to do those things to me right there in the driveway, and honestly, the only consolation was that I might not have to be awake for it, as breathing was so hard by that point that I felt like I was about to pass out. The guy then basically threw me onto the front lawn, which was slightly out of sight of the road outside thanks to this big hedge the family had been cultivating over the years. The entire North Dakota Highway Patrol Force could have driven by and never seen a freaking thing. I was basically screwed in more ways than one. Then right as the guy was standing over me, I heard this little voice bark, Leave her alone, from the doorway to the house. 
It was the kid I was babysitting. The little man. Who had somehow woken up during everything that was going on, heard the guy talking, and headed downstairs to see what was going on. I don't know exactly what went through the guy's head after seeing a little kid watching what he was about to do. Like I said earlier, I'm almost certain that he had kids of his own, but it was enough to make him think twice. He backed off a little and told me that I was the luckiest little girl on the face of the earth, then started telling the little man that I was babysitting that he was helping me up because I'd fallen down. The kid didn't buy it for a second though, and I've always been amazed at how brave he was in that moment as he once again let out this impossibly loud bark for how small he was, saying, Leave my dotty alone. I was already scrambling back towards the house by the time the guy started walking out of the driveway, and all I had going through my head was to get a 911 dispatcher to listen as I read out the guy's license plate. I didn't know where he was parked, but it had to be close and all I needed to do was get to my phone fast enough and I'd be able to get this guy arrested. Sadly, I wasn't fast enough, and by the time I rushed back out into the road outside, all I would see was a flash of the guy's rear lights in the distance before they faded into nothingness. I managed to tell the dispatcher as much as I could, including what he looked like and the stretch of highway I figured that he might have been driving down. But since I had no idea what car he was driving, I guess it wasn't enough for the cops to get him on a traffic stop or anything. After the call ended, I tried my best to protect the little guy from the horrifying truth of what had happened, but he was smart enough to know that a bad man had come to the house, and that for a few moments, the both of us had been in a terrifying amount of danger. He was still awake when his mom and dad got home, but they could just instantly tell that something bad had happened. Their only issue was that I hadn't called to tell them what had happened, but I just didn't want to ruin one of their rare date nights given that no one actually got hurt. I mean, I had one heck of a bruise around my throat the next day, but aside from that, I got away pretty much unscathed. Now that I look back on it, I don't think the guy ever really had the intention of truly hurting me, I guess. If he was psycho enough to do something like that, I don't think that he'd have really cared if the kid was watching. I just think having a teen girl give him such disrespect made him really, really angry. And maybe he was having just bad enough a day that he felt like taking some spite out on me or something. I have no idea. But then again, I've always been inclined to see the best in people. And I'm still something of a perennial optimist. So maybe I'm wrong in that instinct. Maybe it really was the little man who saved me from a horrific fate that night, and that a six-year-old had way more strength, power, and bravery than anyone might assume. Back when I was a kid, I had this regular babysitter who was the daughter of one of my dad's co-workers. I kind of hated her at the time. She was terrible at her job. I had other babysitters who I actually liked, so I knew she was terrible. She seemed like she just didn't want to be there at all. She was always super strict with me, just overzealously carrying my parents' rules to the letter as a way of taking out her spite on me. So, I got used to doing things like calling downstairs first if I wanted to get a glass of water after bedtime, or not even daring to turn my nightlight on because she made me sleep with my door open so she could check on me easily. It sounds harsh, I know, but my parents were always pretty strict too, and I guess my dad's co-worker figured their influence, as well as the responsibility, would do her some good. Anyways, this one night when the babysitter arrived, she seemed different. I remember mom and dad, the poor naive souls that they were, telling her that it was okay if she didn't feel well and wanted to be driven back home. She refused, just telling them that she felt a little tired and would take a nap once I'd been put down to bed. And boy, did she seem tired. She was nodding out as I was eating dinner, was way, way laxer than she usually was, and I remember thinking that if she was like that every time she babysat me in the future, I wouldn't have to dread her arrival anymore. She actually forgets to put me to bed on time, too, so I got like 45 minutes of extra TV while she napped on the couch. And for a while, 
she was actually sleeping with her phone held up near her face. I thought it was the funniest thing at the time, but if I had known what was actually going on, I wouldn't have thought it was so amusing. A few hours later, I woke up incredibly thirsty, so I stick my head out into the hallway and start calling out to her, asking permission to come downstairs to get a glass of water, as we agreed. Then for the first time since she started babysitting me, there's no reply when I call her name. There's no, oh my god, what do you want now? No, go back to sleep, kid, jeez. Nothing like that. Just complete silence aside from the low hum on the TV from downstairs, and I know something is off. I just don't know what exactly, so I head downstairs to try to find her. I grew up in quite a big home, one with an upstairs and a downstairs bathroom. The downstairs bathroom door was only ever closed when it was being used, so that clued me into the fact that she was in there. I just stood there at the door for a few seconds, actually kind of worried about how much trouble I'd get in for being downstairs after bedtime. But then it hit me that something had seemed off that night, that my babysitter wasn't feeling well, and that she might be in some kind of trouble herself. I knocked on the door, called out her name again, only to find that the door actually opened a little under the force of my knock. People always lock the door when they use the bathroom down there. I mean, people were always walking around outside, so they always locked it. I knew something was wrong, so I pushed it open, and my babysitter is just sitting there, toilet lid down, slumped back with something sticking out of her arm. I didn't even really recognize it for what it was in the moment. I didn't know anything about drugs, and the only needles I'd ever gotten were with me facing away from it and wincing, so it's not like I just recognized the thing off the bat. I thought she was asleep. I mean, I honestly just thought she was napping. I know she was leaning back against the toilet, head slumped over, and that any grown-up in their right mind would have known something was wrong. But she also just looked really peaceful. So peaceful that I didn't want to wake her. I just got my glass of water, then went back to bed to drift back off to sleep. The next thing I know, I woke up to the sound of my mom screaming. And then the rest of the night is kind of a blur for me. A flash of blue and red lights outside and phone calls and weeping and wailing. But then almost equally worse was how my mom and dad just seemed to try to forget the whole thing. I think they did it for my sake so I wouldn't realize how my inaction had been the nail in this girl's coffin. That if I had only have called someone, raised the alarm in any way, there might have been a chance that she'd still be alive. In October of 2012, six-year-old Lucia Krim and two-year-old Leo Krim were living with their parents, Marina and Kevin, at the La Rochelle apartment building on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. The Krims had moved to New York from San Francisco in 2010 after Kevin found work as a digital content executive at the television network CNBC. On the other hand, Marina Krim was a former kindergarten teacher turned stay-at-home mother who occupied herself by teaching art and chronicling her children's lives through a series of video blogs. There's no doubt that Marina was a dedicated mother, but she couldn't be there for all her children and all the time. And this is where Yaslin Ortega enters the picture. Originally from Santiago de los Caballeros in the Dominican Republic, Ortega was a 50-year-old naturalized U.S. citizen during October of 2012. She resided on Riverside Drive in Manhattan's Hamilton Heights, along with her 17-year-old son, Jesus, her sister, and her niece. And to support them, she gained employment as the Crims family babysitter for $18 an hour. By October of 2012, Ortega had been the Crims family babysitter for almost two years and had earned the trust of both Marina and her husband. So much so that Marina trusted her to take her six-year-old Lulu to her ballet lessons. One of their usual routines was that while Ortega took Lulu to her ballet lessons, Marina would accompany three-year-old Nessie to the girls' swimming lessons at the nearby YMCA. After Lulu's ballet lesson was over, Marina was to bring Nessa to the ballet venue, meet Ortega, and they would all make their way back to the Crim's apartment together to have dinner. 
Yet on October 25th of 2012, when Marina arrived at the ballet venue to meet Ortega, she discovered that neither Lulu or her babysitter had arrived for the ballet lesson. Confused, Marina headed back to the La Rochelle apartment, assuming that Lulu was feeling unwell and that there was some other legitimate reason for her failing to attend the lesson. Yet when she arrived home, she walked into every parent's worst nightmare. She expected the apartment to be occupied, and for a concerned Ortega to rush to her with an explanation why Lulu failed to attend her ballet lesson. Yet as Marina walked inside, the lights were off, almost as if there was no one home. Marina called out for her children, and then called out for Ortega, but there was no reply, so instead of actually investigating the remainder of the apartment, she went back downstairs to the building's doorman to inquire about her children. Upon being questioned, it was the doorman's turn to express confusion. He had seen Yaslin Ortega as she and the children had stepped into the building's elevator just a few hours before. To his knowledge, they hadn't left the building either, not by the front entrance anyway, so there was no reason why they shouldn't still be inside the Crim's apartment. Marina began to realize that something was wrong, but the extent of the horror that awaited her was something she could have never expected. Marina returned to the apartment to search high and low for any sign of her children and their babysitter. Then when she arrived in one of the family's bathrooms, she let out a blood-curdling scream that was thick with grief. Lying in the bathtub, in a pool of their own blood, were the lifeless corpse of two-year-old Leo and six-year-old Lulu. It was a sight that just about anyone would have found sickeningly horrifying but for a mother to witness her own children in such a state, it was enough to drive Marina to madness. Yet the horror wasn't over, not by a long shot. Kneeling next to the bathtub, the bloody knife still in her grip, was Yaslin Ortega. She had been in what amounted to a catatonic state until Marina had walked into the bathroom, but the grief-stricken mother's scream dragged Yaslin out of her trance with the reality of her actions hitting her with all the force of a runaway freight train. Yoslin looked up at Marina, then down at the children. Then after unleashing a banshee's scream of her own, she jammed the knife into one of her wrists and began sawing up her own forearm. Before Marina could even react to what Yoslin was doing, the once loyal babysitter brought the knife up to her throat and opened it up with a deep slash that left blood streaming down her chest. Thankfully, Marina was being accompanied by the apartment building superintendent, who promptly contacted emergency services when he realized what was happening. It was far too late to save the children, but the EMTs were able to stabilize the gruesome injuries that Yoslin Ortega had inflicted on herself, saving her life to ensure that she would stand trial for the demonic crimes she had committed. Kevin Krim, the children's father, didn't learn of their deaths until that evening, when he returned from a business trip that had taken him back to San Francisco, and to say he was devastated would amount to the understatement of the century. Once she was physically well enough to be questioned, Ortega was alarmingly forthcoming with her motive for murdering the children. She claimed that she was deeply upset that the Krims had rejected her request for more working hours, and that she desperately needed the money and that their refusal was tantamount to a death sentence for her. However, the Crims claimed that they had not actually refused to pay her more money, and had instead offered Ortega a pay raise if she started doing housework for them during her nannying hours. Indeed, Ortega's own family seemed to dismiss the idea that denying her a raise was the motive for the murders, as she was treated very well by the Crim family. On one occasion, the Crims paid for Ortega's plane tickets to see her family in the Dominican Republic, and in another instance, had joined her on vacation there. She was also said to be extremely close to Lulu and Leo, and that the trio had a deeply loving and affectionate relationship as a result of almost two years of near-constant companionship. This led to investigators theorizing that Ortega may have suffered some kind of manic episode, as surely no sane person in her position would have been able to inflict such hideous violence on two innocent children. 
It was argued that evidence of such a manic or disassociative episode was how Ortega seemed to snap back to reality upon hearing Marina Krim's screams. Investigators argued that once she realized what she'd done, attempting to take her own life was the only viable solution to her. After heavy psychoanalysis at a New York City psychiatric hospital, Yaslin was later found mentally competent to stand trial for the murders of two-year-old Leo and six-year-old Lulu. Yet it would take five long years to take her to trial. During that time, Ortega would make over 90 separate court appearances. She opted for a psychiatric defense, claiming she had no memory of the murders and could not explain what happened that afternoon which led to the deaths of the children. Therefore, it seemed perfectly reasonable to her to plead not guilty to the counts of first-degree murder and reject a number of plea deals that would have resulted in lesser sentences than life in prison. Finally, on May 14th of 2018, Yaslin Ortega was sentenced to life in prison without parole. In his final ruling, the presiding judge labeled her as pure evil and dismissed her claims that she wasn't responsible for her behavior. In the aftermath of the children's murder, the New York State Assembly and State Senate passed the Lucia and Leo's Law. The first of its kind in the entire U.S., the Lulu and Leo's Law made it a criminal offense to deliberately misrepresent the mental health of a person applying to work as a child caregiver. No such legislation will bring Leo or Lulu back from the dead, but we can always hope that it might deter such things from happening in the future. Yet following their murders, the big question that seems to linger is, what exactly drove Yaslin Ortega to kill two children she had come to love so deeply? While it may seem like a compelling argument that her mental health was to blame, Ortega had absolutely no history of anxiety or depression aside from a few familial anecdotes. It seems clear to most that the psychiatric defense was simply her attorney's last best hope to land her a reduced sentence. After all, she had been their babysitter for two years with zero complaints regarding her behavior, and she had become a trusted member of the Crims family circle by the time of the murders. Yoselin herself claims she has no memory of the murders, and while this might seem like an awfully convenient aspect of her psychological defense, we can't rule out that she experienced some kind of blackout and committed the murders while in some disassociative state. But then... What else would cause such a blackout? Medical professionals ruled that Yoselin had no kind of ongoing psychological condition at the time of her arrest. But what if she's telling the truth about not remembering the murders? What if something that medical science isn't quite ready to explain yet took Yoselin over? Of course, such a theory might sound like the stuff of fiction. But there was a time in recent history when the idea that tiny microscopic life forms were responsible for causing disease was dismissed by those who saw themselves as the educated elite. Perhaps in time, Yoselin's behavior will be explained by something deemed chilling but feasible, when at the present time, such a concept is too terrifying to even contemplate. Back in 1951, 15-year-old Diane Hank of Portland, Oregon, needed to make a little extra money, and like many young women of her age during that period, babysitting was the surest method of earning a few extra bucks. We often think of babysitting as a safe, family-oriented job, something that verges on wholesome. So when Diane first met husband and wife couple Sherry and Wei Him Fong, and they turned out to be friendly, affable folks, she was thrilled at the prospect of regularly working for them. But what Diane never could have expected was for her to become embroiled in a world of secrets, deceit, drug use, and bloodthirsty criminality. By January 6th of 1954, Diane had been babysitting for the Fongs for three years and had essentially become part of their extended family. Diane had purchased a shirt as a Christmas gift for Wei Him Fong who sometimes went by the anglicized name of Wayne, but almost a week into the new year, she still hadn't presented him with it. When she called up Sherry Fong on the phone and asked if she could swing by to drop it off at their home, Sherry invited her over to dinner. 
After getting her mother's permission to head over to the house, Diane joined the Fongs and another couple named the Smallies while the Fongs children slept in the next room over. The Smallies stayed only for drinks while Sherry Fong prepared dinner, and when the time came for them to depart, they commented on what a delightful young woman the Fongs had found to babysit their children. Little did they know, their first meeting with Diane was also to be their last, as they would never see her alive again. Before she disappeared, two people spoke to Diane on the phone that night. The first was a friend of hers named Anne Encontro, who apparently heard that Diane was having a party and that she was high on something. Not long after, Diane called her mother telling her that she would be home as soon as Wayne Fong returned from an errand as he had promised to give her a ride home. Around an hour later, she once again called her mother, stating that she would be home later than expected, as Mr. Fong had yet to return. Her father then suggested that she spend the night there, a suggestion that Diane agreed with. It was a brief and seemingly inconsequential conversation, but it was the last one Diane and her father would ever have. The following day, when Diane failed to return home, her parents contacted the local police department to report her missing. Almost immediately, the police appealed to the public pleading for information while releasing a steady stream of details to aid in the search. However, a great deal of gossip began to circulate regarding Diane's lifestyle, gossip which painted her in a very negative light, tainting public opinion of her. For example, some claimed it was common knowledge in certain circles that Diane had recently had a baby out of wedlock. Rumors also abounded that she regularly smoked marijuana while listening to subversive jazz music. The revelation caused a deep outrage among the more pious sections of the local community who quickly withdrew their support for Diane's search. Yet a great number remained terrified and heartbroken of the striking six-foot-tall teenager's disappearance and pledged themselves to find her, wherever she may be. Given how Diane was last seen in the company of the Fongs, some began to speculate that they were to blame for the girl's disappearance. After all, the Fongs were a mixed-race couple, and as much as we can be thankful that the tolerance of such things has greatly accelerated, interracial marriages were subject to suspicion and ire during the 1950s. It was also rumored that the Fongs joined Diane in smoking marijuana that night, and that they had morally corrupted the young girl. And once these accusations reached investigators, the police opted to pursue Sherry Fong with a fierce intensity. In response, Sherry insisted on her innocence, and even went so far as to place a personals ad in the Portland Oregonian which read, Diane, please contact me. Regardless of your present circumstances or anything you may have done, I'll help you all I can. Sherry. While some suggested this was merely a ruse on Sherry's part to appear innocent, there's no doubt that their relationship was a close one. Some said that Sherry and Diane were attached to the hip, and that their similar size and stature meant that they frequently borrowed each other's clothes. Sherry had been there for Diane throughout her unplanned pregnancy, and this leaves us in very little doubt that their friendship was a genuine and loving one. It was later discovered that an undercover officer remarked that the Fongs were getting a dirty deal and that the cops were just trying to pin the case on somebody so they could be done with it. One of Diane's Lincoln High classmates claimed to have seen her downtown the day after her disappearance, while another classmate said she ran into Diane at Meyer and Frank department store a couple of weeks later. The police were accused of dismissing these reports because they didn't fit the hypothesis that the Fongs were to blame, and their efforts to pin the crime on them did nothing but muddy the waters. Law enforcement seemed to completely ignore that Kenneth Martin, Diane's boyfriend at the time of her disappearance, and the father of her child were reported to have told her that he would kill her if he ever saw her with another boy. Sherry Fong said this left Diane distraught to the point of potentially taking her own life over her relationship problems and that she'd once commented, if he stands up again, I'll take my own life. Tragically, Diane's body was found on February 27th at the top of a steep hill near Evergreen Highway in Clark County, Washington. She had been wrapped in two blankets, tied up with rope, and was wearing the same clothing she wore the night of January 6th when she had gone to the Fongs for dinner. 
In order to put pressure on her, investigators questioned Sherry Fong for 16 hours without a break, but still she refused to make any kind of confession. The police then set up a kind of sting operation at a local hotel, where they tried to eavesdrop on a conversation she was having with a friend in the next room. This friend was nothing of the sort, and was actually one of those who suspected Sherry of Diane's murder. Then over the course of an hour or two, she attempted to coax a confession out of Sherry. Once again, Sherry protested her innocence, but it seemed to do nothing to dissuade law enforcement of her guilt. A short while later, a grand jury indicted both her and Wayne based almost entirely on circumstantial evidence, along with a third person named Kwong Ting Yi. Kwong was described by local newspapers as a frequent house guest of the Fongs, with some asserting that he was Wayne Fong's partner in marijuana trafficking. Sherry and Wayne were eventually tried together, and after being found guilty, the jury voted 10-2 to 2 to send them to the gas chamber. However, in a move that stunned the general public, the trial judge overturned the verdict on the grounds that the prosecution had failed to provide anything more than circumstantial evidence. Yet it didn't mean the Fongs were in the clear, and a retrial was quickly scheduled. It was during this retrial that a mountain of new information came to light, information that could have saved Diane's life had she known about it before she started working for the Fongs. It was proven beyond all doubt that the Fongs were heavily involved in the Portland drug scene, with Wayne Fong being a major ringleader. Now in light of this, the prosecution began to claim that Diane was killed because she knew too much about the Fong's black market operation, and they needed her permanently silenced if they wished to continue making money. One of the state's key witnesses, Mrs. Smalley, testified that by the time she left, Diane had already consumed a number of alcoholic drinks and was acting silly. The prosecution then used this to illustrate how irresponsibly the Fongs had behaved around a 15-year-old girl, and even alleged that they had plied her with marijuana to the point that she was an emotional and physical wreck. These days it's quite clear that cannabis is fairly harmless on its own, but mix it with alcohol and that's a completely different story. Yet the reality is that the Fongs appear to have given Diane way more than just pot and booze. Tests showed that Diane had a large amount of barbiturates in her system at the time of her death, which the official cause was said to be a mix of barbitol and alcohol poisoning. While it's entirely possible that the overdose was accidental, and that Diane had somehow taken the barbitol without the Fong's knowledge, it stands to reason that they would want to cover up her death, regardless of exactly how it happened, as any personal link to them would cause their narcotics operation to come crashing down. At best, the prosecution's evidence was almost entirely circumstantial, and a second attempt to convict the Fongs resulted in another mistrial. It would take a third round of court proceedings to get a conviction on Sherry, and that time, some seriously disturbing details emerged during the process. During the course of the two failed trials, the police kept up their efforts to place informants close to Sherry and Wayne, and it was during a conversation with one of them that Sherry mentioned that a Chinese crime syndicate had wanted Diane killed because they felt she was talking too much. Sherry claimed that she had offered to pay as much as $125,000 to get them to leave the girl alone, but in the grand scheme of things, this could neither be confirmed nor refuted. Evidence also emerged that Wayne had tried to kill two witnesses that may have testified against him, a Filipino immigrant named Pio Rigo testified about the culture of fear and how important it was to stay quiet while working for the Fongs. He also testified in broken English that he had helped Wayne move a body, though he couldn't specify if it was Diane's or not, and he had no idea where Wayne had actually disposed of it. The third trial concluded with Sherry being convicted of second-degree murder, but just like the first two, the conviction didn't stick. The case went all the way to the Oregon Supreme Court, and after her fourth and final trial in a federal court, Sherry Fong was completely acquitted of having any hand in Diane's death. The fact that judgment came in a federal court meant there would be no more arrests, no more questions, no more trials. For Sherry, at least, the ordeal was over. Wayne's trials went much in the same way that his wife's did, 
and he was eventually cleared of all charges just a few months after her final trial came to a conclusion. His luck wouldn't last, though, and in 1958 he was arrested and charged with possession of heroin, a crime he would serve 12 years in prison for. By the time the judicial ordeal was over, the Fongs were considerably more infamous than Diane had ever been, and a case that should have been marked by tragedy was overtaken by gossip and scandal. Diane was an intelligent, hard-working, and upwardly mobile young woman whose life was snuffed out before it truly had a chance to begin. She left behind a daughter who would never know her mother's love, and an extended family who would grieve her absence until their dying days. Yet pain and grief weren't the only things that remained when all was said and done, as boundless unanswered questions plagued all those involved in the case for decades. Perhaps one of the most pertinent is the question of if Diane was self-medicating on the night of her death. She certainly had a lot to drink, and we can assume she dabbled in marijuana, but was the cocktail of narcotics enough to really dull the pain of stress of her failing relationship? Maybe she decided it wasn't enough and knew of Barbital's potential to dull the senses. Then, with or without the Fong's permission or guidance, she took enough of the drug to cause her young organs to fail one by one, until she was dead. But then again, perhaps that night provided the perfect opportunity for the Fongs to carry out the orders of the Chinese narcotics syndicate. Perhaps they actually offered her the Barbotol at a time they knew it would have a fatal effect on her, making a near-perfect murder look like nothing more than a tragic accident. But then again, maybe the Fongs were finally acquitted, not as a miscarriage of justice, but out of divine providence. Maybe they really were telling the truth, and that their shady occupation had no bearing on their capacity to murder Diane Hank. It shouldn't be lost on anyone that Diane's boyfriend, a person who had threatened to kill her if he ever saw her in the company of another man, was questioned on only a handful of occasions before the focus of the investigation moved to the Fongs. It's very, very possible that Diane simply decided to walk home from the Fongs that night, that the combination of cocktails and cannabis left her feeling so emotionally raw that she couldn't bear to burden such close friends with her deep depression. Then what if, in the course of walking back home, she'd encountered Kenneth Martin, who had flown into a rage at the idea of her drinking and smoking with Wayne Fong? Maybe Kenneth made good on his promise to end his baby mother's life, if she ever even considered betraying him. From what I can tell, Kenneth had relatives who lived up in Washington State, maybe even relatives who would have been willing to help him dump a body somewhere they'd hoped it might never be found. All that is little but speculation, though, as the police refused to pursue the possibility that Kenneth was ever to blame for Diane's death. We sometimes think of the 1950s as a more innocent, optimistic time in America, a period that followed one of the darkest times in world history when people were hopeful and happy. Maybe the Portland police simply couldn't face the possibility that a teenage boy had watched his child's mother die from an overdose, knowing he could see her dead for her supposed betrayal while keeping his hands clean of any concrete involvement. Such a tale would make for one of the deepest, darkest things a person could ever hear. So maybe it was just easier on their collective sanity to twist the story until it made sense, for lack of a better term. We can only hope that Whoever was responsible for Diane's death suffered from the guilt of knowing that they had snuffed out boundless potential. A woman whose life could have been a bright light in a world so full of darkness. Back in November of 2015, a woman by the name of Nicole Fitz realized that her living situation was simply untenable. She no longer felt safe around the roommate she was living with in Daly City, California, and given that she had two young daughters to support and protect, she quickly began looking for alternate forms of accommodation. Nicole began taking on a great deal of overtime in order to save up for a deposit on a place in the San Francisco Bay Area, but it's also worth noting that the reason she began working so extensively is because she knew that once she moved out, her tyrannical roommate would make it extremely difficult to retrieve her belongings. 
In Nicole's eyes, it was better to avoid any kind of confrontation that might result in harm to herself or her children. And with that in mind, the solution was simple. Work her butt off to secure a strong financial situation, then hire a babysitter to take care of her daughters while she was away from home. This is how husband and wife babysitter Alina and David Martin became young Ariana's full-time caregivers. The two families quickly developed a deep rapport, and Nicole would later describe the Martins as being supportive, friendly, and especially helpful at a time when she needed it most. The arrangement was a purely informal one. No papers or contracts were ever signed or agreed upon, but that suited the tremendously busy Nicole who was sometimes sleeping less than four or five hours a night just to keep up with work while she looked for a new place to live. In order to provide her with a more stable kind of home life, two-year-old Ariana would often stay overnight at the Martins' place in Oakland, California. And between commuting to her work in San Francisco, working overtime, finding a place to stay in the Bay Area, and balancing everyday life, Nicole would visit Ariana as much as she could. Finally, in February of 2016, Nicole got the good news that she had been waiting for. One of Nicole's co-workers invited her and Ariana to move into her apartment in San Francisco, a place just minutes away from Nicole's place of work. It was as close to an ideal result as she could have ever wished for. But when she contacted the Martins with the good news, they seemed less than pleased for her. Nicole must have been painfully confused at their reaction. They were so close by that point that she had expected them to be elated for her. But Helen greeted the news with an almost muted, indifferent tone. It wasn't anything like the reaction Nicole had been expecting, but her confusion soon grew into a deep anxiety of what followed. When Nicole tried to arrange a time and date to collect Ariana, Helen Martin simply hung up the phone and then refused to pick it up again. Nicole tried everything she could to get in touch with the Martins, and it took two whole weeks before she was able to get them on the phone again. Towards the end of February, the Martins told Nicole that the reason she couldn't collect her daughter was because they'd taken her to Disneyland, and that they'd contact her as soon as they were home so they could arrange a collection. Nicole remained extremely suspicious of this, but she apparently trusted the Martins so much that they swallowed the excuse whole. It kept her from contacting the police regarding any kind of potential kidnap, and stalled her long enough for them to keep hold of Ariana for six weeks without letting Nicole see her. According to Nicole's new roommate, Goyette Williams, it was only a matter of time before an increasingly desperate Nicole lost her patience and gave the Martins a deadline. According to Williams, Nicole snapped when she finally got them on the phone, saying something along the lines of, Okay, April 3rd, I want my daughter. I'm coming to get her. She's coming to live with me. End of story. Nicole didn't have to wait that long, as on the night of April 1st, she told Goyette Williams that the Martins had been in touch with her. Williams later said that Nicole had told her, I have to meet my babysitter. She's over at some restaurant on 3rd Street. She's upset. I need to go see if she's okay. Nicole said she'd only be gone for five minutes, but hours came and went, and the young mother completely failed to return. In the wee small hours of the following morning, Goyette received a text from Nicole's phone at around 12.45 a.m., stating that she was on her way to Fresno with somebody named Sam. Goyette had never heard Nicole mention a guy named Sam before and demanded to know exactly who he was, but no reply came from her roommate's phone. Days passed, with Nicole failing to reappear at Goyette's apartment, and so on April 5th of 2016, she and two-year-old Ariana were officially reported missing to the San Francisco Police Department. Just less than a week later, the Fitz family received the heartbreaking news that they prayed they'd never have to hear. Nicole's body was found curled up in a fetal position in a shallow grave located a few feet away from a children's play area. Her grave was covered with a plywood board, one with a symbol painted on one side that did not appear to come from a location within the park. The cops believed that the symbol might amount to a valuable clue in the search for her killers and begged anyone who recognized it to come forward. But to this day, not a single person has approached them with any pertinent information on the meaning of the symbol or who might have drawn it. The fact that Nicole had been found was of almost no comfort to her family, 
as not only was she deceased, but little Ariana was still missing, presumably having been kidnapped by the Martin family. To this day, Ariana is still missing, and her location remains a complete mystery. Even more frustrating is the fact that the police have been completely unable to link the Martins with Nicole's murder, meaning the people most likely to be responsible for her death are still walking the streets as free individuals. When questioned by law enforcement, the Martins, as well as their immediate family members, have either given inconsistent statements regarding Ariana's potential whereabouts or have refused to cooperate with the investigation entirely. Law enforcement conducted three full searches of houses belonging to friends of relatives of the Martins in Emeryville, Oakland, and Daly City, but were saddened to report that there was no sign of Ariana anywhere. However, they did seize over 30,000 pieces of evidence which they claim might aid in the search for her, or God forbid, her corpse. There is something extremely noteworthy regarding Helen Martin's past, though, something we should all find extremely disturbing. Helen had once served a six-year prison term for killing the father of her own child, a crime which had seen her child taken away from her and placed in the California foster system. Many have theorized that since she couldn't have her own child back, she simply murdered Nicole Fitz, then stole her daughter away, and is keeping her somewhere secret to raise her as her own. It's a very compelling idea, after all. A woman willing to murder her own husband would have few qualms about killing someone she barely knew, especially if the goal was to realize her dreams of motherhood. As it stands, it's been over six long years since Ariana was last seen alive, and police have started to release computer-generated images of how she might look at around seven or eight years old. We can only pray that these images help someone to identify her. That is, if she's even still alive, to be recognized. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, get on your knees and smile like a donut.